All right, today we have Ray on the show. Ray, what's going on, brother? Hey, how are you? Uh, Thanks man. for having me. I'm glad you're here. So uh, just to kind of give some background as to how this kind of unfolded for me, uh, somebody, I'm not sure who, I wish I could remember who or where I saw it so that I could give proper ado, but somebody sent me a link that you, uh, to the first recording you did with uh, Terry Carter and talking about you and your family's experience uh, over in Afghanistan, uh, in Kand yeah. Kandahar, and involving mm -hmm. the giant, uh, or at least giants over there may not be the Kandahar giant that everybody talks about. You know, I I know for my well, let's put it this way: I believe to the point that I will confidently say I know there's more than one giant in <laughs> over there. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But I I found the interview very interesting and. Uh, I was fortunate that Terry had put out your name. So I, I did some of my, my I, I dusted off my internet sleuth skills and I hit the, the good old Facebook and found you. And uh, right. yeah. I, found, I found it interesting though that you and I are really, really actually from the, the same area. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, were we just are. telling me how your sister graduated from the same high school as me uh, a, year, yeah. a year before I graduated. So uh, yeah, that's I believe so. Yeah kind of crazy man it's kind of crazy small world but uh little did i know back then i'd be a podcaster let alone there was somebody in my school that had a brother that had such a radical story as yours so um what i'd like to have you do is to kind of lay the foundation for people to understand uh how this kind of all unfolded for you because uh this isn't something that you were raised with your family hearing about uh you have a whole life journey that got you to the point where you were reconnecting with your family. So if you could just kind of define and lay that groundwork for people so they understand that uh, where you're coming from as we this conversation unfolds. Okay. Um, my family is from Afghanistan and originally Kandahar. Um, the capital, I believe, is Kabul. It's Kabul. And Kandahar is another city that is inside of that country that my family's from. And my grandmother was for all intents and purposes uh, a practicing witch i'm not sure the origin of her practices or what she did exactly but my father told me that he witnessed her doing some really strange things when he was growing up and um my father after witnessing these things i'm not sure what kind of impact it had on him but he went through his life. He was a tailor master. He was also really into uh, feats of strength. He's what you would call like a pelwan over there. That's like a word for a strongman. Um, and he had like an old black sewing machine that he could pick up while he was sitting down cross-legged and hold out to arm's length in front of him. And back then they weighed like 60, 70 pounds. Wow. So he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a very powerful guy. He used to be able to bend coins in his hand when he was young and I only know that that's true because um, some of the other Afghans in the community in Reading substantiated it. They said, yeah, your dad was very, very strong when he was young. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So Afghans that made their way from Afghanistan to Reading, Pennsylvania knew of your dad and his strength. Yeah, wow. yeah. Some of, some of them, some of the old timers, um, like the other elderly Afghan men, uh, you know, because they would always get together and they'd go to the mosque together. They play cards, you know, playing playing cards is huge in Afghanistan. And I never learned how to do it because I didn't grow up um, with them. I still to this day don't really know any card games. So, you know, I'm not going to win any poker tournaments anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> but um, yeah, pr pretty much uh, my father, he also did some other things to get by uh, in his country, which was the drug trade. From what I understand, he was involved and some of his family members were involved in um, clandestine, illegal. Well, maybe it's not illegal in Afghanistan, but I, I don't know if they turn a blind eye. I don't know how that works, but he was involved in the opium and all of that as well. And that, I guess, is a normal thing over there. It's kind of like Jamaicans with their marijuana. It, I guess it's stereotypical, but um, you know, to them, they don't really bat an eye about it. Anyway, so my father, through one way or another, ended up uh, getting his family over here to America. And once he was over here, he didn't adhere to the standards of living that a lot of parents have to adhere to in order to make sure that their children are raised in a safe environment. 
My father completely dropped the ball on that. My mother was mentally sick. She suffered from manic depression and schizophrenia. Um, that ran in her side of the family as well. It didn't afflict everyone in the family, but her specifically and her oldest brother, his name was Agamama, and he disappeared in the mountains of uh, Pakistan one day. I, I believe I was an infant when this happened, but he had mental illness really, really bad. He had really, really long hair. He played the setar. Um, I believe he was on the spectrum pretty hard. He had some form of really advanced autism. And he just went out into the mountains, the treacherous Afghan hills, and he just disappeared. No one ever saw him again. Wow. Yeah. So my, fa my father, uh, he didn't exactly assimilate very well into the American culture. Partially because he hung around uh, a lot of, I guess you could say, kind of seedy individuals from his uh, old country. But that was neither here nor there. Um, if you decide to have children, you have to stand by them and take care of them. You have to make sure that, at the very least, they're not put in a position where you potentially are going to lose them. And uh, so one thing led to another. and. My father was never around. My mom, my mother had me mental illness and child protective services ended up getting involved because of all of the abuse and neglect that was going on in our home. Uh, to this day, we had one of the most dysfunctional homes I've ever witnessed in my life. And uh, yeah, that's a huge reason I am who I am. And a lot of people out there who are watching this, they might be able to relate or not, but um when, when, when you have to witness some of the things we witnessed growing up and some of the things we were subjected to, you can't really enjoy the rest of your childhood after that. So that that's, that's pretty much what led us into foster care was a lot of abuse and neglect. Now, my two oldest sisters, God bless them, they did the best they could, and they did kind of take up the mantle of parents. Um, but that that wasn't good enough because they still had their schooling to go to and stuff. And they went to Reading high school. And one of my sisters, I believe graduated in 94 and the other would have graduated in 95 or 96, but I believe she ended up getting her GED and we were placed in foster care in 1995. So I was placed in a home in Warminster, Pennsylvania, which is in Bucks County. And we were coming from Reading, Pennsylvania. And I, when I say Reading, Pennsylvania, I mean the inner city. So for all intents and purposes, up until I was eight years old, I was indeed a ghetto little hood rat. <laughs> I really was. I'd, I'd break car windows. I was, I was a hooligan. I, w I had a very, very bad example at home, which was my father. Let me watch R-rated movies. Uh, I watched softcore porn on hbo when i was like seven or eight i didn't know what it was hey i had no clue <laughs> so i mean this is the type of stuff freddy krueger movies when you're seven years old this is not stuff children are supposed to be watching or experience or go through um we'd watch a lot of wwe wrestling and i said we were subjected to abuse well my father he wanted to practice these wrestling moves who do you think he practiced them on? oh man <laughs> practiced them on me and you didn't really have to be bad to and, and, you know, that, that wasn't when he like, he didn't break me or anything, but, uh, he, uh, he wasn't gentle. We'll put it that way. And that, that's just how it was. You know, that's how my father was. My father growing up played that sport where you're on horseback and you're grabbing a goat and throwing it into a ring. So my father, you know, when people say he was strong, you have to be a very, very strong individual to play that game because this dead goat weighs maybe 40, 50 pounds. You're on horseback. You're moving all crazy. You're gripping one hand and you've got to grab this thing while the horse is running and not snap your arm. So it's, it's a very, it's like polo, but the third world version with a dead goat, <laughs> it's, 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 it's insane. Uh, they would also play games where they would tie a bear like, uh, or an animal of some kind to a chain and they would release dogs on it. And they would take bets on who's going to win the, the wild animal or the, the dogs. Um, there, there was a lot, it's like cockfighting, but a lot more severe. So my, my dad was a very, very rough around the edge individual. So I hope the audience gets a sense of what I dealt with at home and what my family dealt with at home was this type of individual that 
he's just he's a hooligan <laughs> you know he's he's like he's he's kind of kind of has a screw loose but um so we were placed in foster care because of those reasons and the foster home i was placed in was with a pastor and his wife and they were some of the most loving sweet people i've ever met they raised me and my brother pretty well until i was eight, 18 years old and uh i would say in 2001 when 9 11 happened my life did kind of change then uh i was pretty happy in my social life and then all of a sudden i had to face a lot of ostracization because of my heritage, which I, I wasn't even connected to. I mean, I was over here living with Caucasian Christian people. Mm -hmm. I went to church three times a week. I mean, I had no dog in that fight, but you know, people brought their propaganda to me and suddenly my life just took a complete turn. And I couldn't say I was middle Eastern even without someone treating me some type of way. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, other it, it, it was people of all backgrounds that would treat you differently. Anyone who paid attention to what the news was saying for almost two decades up until about two years ago, um, they, they really fed into the media Kool-Aid about how bad the people are over there. The government, sure, every government has its you know picadillos, but so I graduated from um, Exeter Senior High School over there in Berks County. Uh, I went there for my senior year. And I was in foster care from 1995 all the way until 2005. And I graduated in 2005 uh, from Exeter High School. And from there, I decided, well, I'm not going to college. I'm not, you know, I tried to go into the Marines, but I wasn't going to get into the Marines because I was blind. I'm blind in one eye. Um, well, not blind, but I can't see so well. It, it was bad enough at the time where they said, hey, we can't accept you unless you get a uh, corrective surgery for this. Um, so I, you know, I reached out to my real parents and they were thrilled to have me. Uh, my biological parents invited me into their home and they wanted me to live with them. So when I started living with them, I started going through a whole culture shock all over again. Uh, they weren't the most hygienic people. And I'm not saying Afghani people aren't because Afghani people are very cleanly, but my parents were not. <laughs> and by this time they were senior citizens and there was no one to care for them. So I kind of took up that role where I cleaned up after them and I, I tried to, you know, they're, they're allowing me to live with them now and it's the least I could do. So that's yeah. what started to happen. Let me ask you a question real quick before we go any further. Just as, This is actually sure. something that um, kind of bounced off what you just said, which is almost a little side trail. But from what I understand, Middle Eastern people, their culture... Uh, is very clean because of the religion and yes. it, it's, it's, yeah, it is, it's like a it requirement is. cleanliness is part mm -hmm. of the requirement of your faith yeah yeah it, it, it is um they they you know they wash up before and after they pray and they do that you know on top of the two showers they might take a day so they're washing up 12 times a day if you think about yeah. it yeah um yeah yeah it's, it's a lot but hey it's dedication right right and so you know my, my parents that i don't ever remember them being very clean but hey no problem that's actually what led me to be a janitor for 12 years was getting so used to cleaning up. I said, Hey, I mean this, um, I guess I'm okay at this. I'm okay with doing this. So I might as well just make, make this my job. And make that's what I ended up doing for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of didn't ask for cleaning work, but I kind of grew into it if you will. But anyway, um, I started meeting up with old family members as well and friends of family. You know, a lot of these other families that came from the same region as my father, and some of them he knew growing up or when he was an adult. And then they came over here and they said, Hey, look me up whenever you come to America. So that's what he ended up doing. And we bounced around from place to place as he was doing that. Uh, I believe we came here to Philadelphia and I was 10 months old. And then we went straight to, I believe, Schenectady, New York, where he knew people stayed there for a little while. Wasn't for him. Came back down to Philly. Wasn't for him. We ended up settling in Berks County in Reading. And, um, so some of these stories I started hearing from some of these people were kind of bord bordering on, uh, I guess you would say superstition, old wives tales, uh, just not really stuff that I didn't see outside of a movie. I mean, I, I can't really substantiate anything these people are saying in my own experiences, but 
I've seen that in movies. I've heard about that in movies, you know, things with shadow figures and shadow beings. And I asked my dad one day, um, have you seen anything crazy? He said one day, yes. Uh, you know, I I've seen my mother do some really weird stuff, but one day out in the mountains, I saw something pretty peculiar. I was camping out coming from a friend's home and I woke up in the morning and there was this really, really large footprint down by the river. And he said he could almost have like laid in it. It was as long as he was tall. And he was really, really kind of, I guess, not, not hysterical, but he, he was freaked out because he recalls his mother doing stuff when he was younger. And when he was young, his mother would oftentimes take an, uh, an animal, a, a, a livestock. You know, I don't know if it was a sheep. I, I, I know he said he had a lot of goats, so it might have been the goat. But he said they took the sheep or the goat. I'm pretty sure it was the goat. And just tied it up at the uh, cave there. And he kind of waited at the bottom while she went up and did this and came back down. And they would leave. And he said the one time he heard this animal start screaming. So let's fast forward to when he saw this footprint when he's a teenager now. He asked his mother about it. And she said, well, I told you to stay out of those caves. And if you don't want to find out what that footprint is from, you should continue to stay out of those caves. So he told me this story and, you know, like all the other stories I heard from, you know, the Afghan people that I reconnected with, I kind of dismissed it. I'm like, you know, these, whatever, you know, I guess every culture has these scary stories in the dark, if you will. I, I just thought it was just stuff to like scare the kids. You know, oh, don't stay out too late. The giant's going to get you. Um, so a couple years later, uh, this would have been in, I would, I would, I think it was 2010 because I was working at Park City Mall in Lancaster. I was working at one of those kiosks there. And, uh, you know, I had free Wi Fi and I had just bought a laptop. So I was surfing YouTube and, you know, I, I had first seen that movie, uh, that documentary called Loose Change about the whole 9 11 uh, thing. And I started going down these rabbit holes. And then I remember seeing something about a Kandahar giant. And I saw the video. It was almost like an animation style thing. Um, and I, I, I was like, okay, well, this is, this is kind of weird. So I went back and asked my father about it. And my dad kind of substantiated uh, what was going on. And he said, he said, yeah, these, these creatures that we were leaving these animals for are these gins. And you're telling me about this video that you saw where these American soldiers just got slaughtered. So that that's probably what it was. That's I, I couldn't imagine it was anything else. And that's how I came to know about it. And then a few years later, my father, um, he had a series of surgeries and he ended up dying from a stroke in his sleep. And that was in our home right by Warhouse gym, Dana Lynn Bailey's gym. Uh, we lived across the street. We lived right there off, uh, Bingaman. Yeah. We lived across from that little bamboo forest there. One of seven wow. Bingaman, North, North Bingaman street in Mount Penn there, right around the corner from the post office and around the corner from, uh, that, that really, really awesome little tavern. I forget what it was called, but yeah, so that, that's pretty much how I came to know about this stuff is through my father and he seemed like a very traumatized individual in the i would say eight years that i lived with him uh after foster care so you know kind, kind of didn't didn't really really ever let anyone in well i i can understand in a sense that like your dad i remember you mentioning before about his age. I mean, he's born in 36, I think you said, or something like that. I mean, it, yeah. it was, it was yeah. quite a while ago. So, I mean, the cultures were very different and, uh, just in general, you know, you kind of keep things to yourself, but having a mom that was probably a witch didn't do, it, didn't yep. do any help, you know? Um, so on this stuff, this, 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 these topics, uh, your dad saw the footprint. How large was this footprint that he saw? Was it, you know, 15 inches, 20 inches? How large was it? Well, my, my father is about five foot five when he was alive. 
So maybe about, you know, 65 inches. Okay. So it was as big as him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And he said there was a succession of them kind of heading in a direction and they were really far apart. And, you know, it was like on the trail, if you will. So he couldn't like not see it. And I suppose if you just see one of them, it's like, okay, maybe it's a coincidence that it's shaped like a foot. But if you see something shaped like a right foot and a left foot, you know, every 20 feet or so, <laughs> that's a little bit, that, that's a little bit disconcerting. If your mother told you this, you know, this thing about stay out of those caves and I don't know if he was near a cave or not, but he was definitely right there by the river. So uh, maybe he was thinking it came in the night or something, or maybe it was just before that. And he, it, you know, the, the print was already there cause he was camped down a little ways from it. And, uh, yeah, he was, he, he was really, really disturbed by that. And so the idea with your grandmother and the goats uh, was it like an offering? Do you think that's what was going on? Like she was offering these things, the, the goats to the giants? Yeah, I think there was a form of ritual sacrifice going on there. Do you think it was to appease the giants or do you think that it was literally some kind of witchcraft ritual? <sighs> See, I thought about that before as well. I don't know if my grandmother was pulling like a Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones where she's like co- trying to protect the whole village from the proverbial Mad King, you know? Um, in the, in this case, the giant would have been like the mad King, but I, I don't, I don't know if she was using the sigil magic and the witchcraft she was doing to just appease or to protect maybe a little bit of both. I'm not really sure, but my father, you know, he, he, he definitely told me that he saw other things, uh, in the home. And that's, uh, that's all the more reason that he was really kind of disturbed that, his, his mother wouldn't tell him what this thing was, but she said those footprints you saw that the thing that lives in the caves, that's from him. So, uh, when it comes to, and I want to get into your, your grandmother and, and these kind of things, uh, sure. but I kind of want to almost kind of walk it back a little bit. And if you could, um, uh, you're so you mentioned about, I think you said on, uh, a, another interview, you mentioned about. I think you said your uncle being part of the CIA in foster care. Yeah. Okay. Wait, yeah. is that the foster care uncle? Is that the, is that the pastor's brother-in-law or brother? No, no, no. He's he, we just called him uncle John. Um, but okay. he was actually a friend of the pastor and wife's daughter who was a missionary over in Baku, Azerbaijan. So on her travels or maybe it was through the church, the, my uh, foster parents, they were part of a, a much bigger church in Baltimore called Greater Grace World Outreach. And their church was basically a little satellite affiliate of that bigger church, uh, which was, I believe, headquartered there. And they were in 220 countries around the world. And I believe their daughter, Susan, went to seminary school there. And they basically sponsored her to go be a missionary over in Azerbaijan. And this was in the early 90s when it was very Muslim. And she was locked up a bunch of times and threatened. And she was a brave woman, very brave woman. Um, but uh, that's, that, that, that's pretty much where, where, that, um, where that relationship came from, I believe, is mm. this guy, John. I won't say his last name, um, but... I don't even know if he's still alive. He was 55 when I met him, 55 or 56. And he was one of the most hardcore dudes that, you know, he's like the brawny man, like on, on the paper towels. He's like legit, wow. the living, breathing brawny man. Yeah. He was, he was a specimen. He's from Minnesota original. Um, and they, they build them tough up there. So. So the reason why I brought that up is because I also know that you you theorize. I don't think you actually have proof of it, but your dad having some kind of involvement in in intelligence. Uh, what, what was your yeah. what's your rationale behind that thought process? Um, well, he'd be gone for months and months at a time when my sisters were young over in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, because my oldest sisters they did they were born in Afghanistan, and then when the fighting broke out there they fled to Pakistan and my father was still gone for months at a time. And he was a truck driver. 
over there. I mean, he, even in America, I remember him getting his CDL when I was about five years old. He went to school for uh, driving a truck and he graduated. I don't think he ever ended up getting a job because he wasn't that literate, but he could drive a truck and he drove those old, um, old Nissan uh, tractors where you would uh, shift on the column and wow. there was no RPM gauge or anything like that. So it's like, I mean, if you ever watch dangerous, like world's most dangerous roads on YouTube, it's, it's pretty cool. Some of the vehicles they drive and you're like, they know their vehicle inside and out. But uh, yeah, we, we speculate my father was doing that um, for not, not directly for the uh, intelligence agencies here in the U S but like an affiliate and, you know, maybe he met somebody who was impressed with him or said, Hey, we could use you when you come to America or something. And then part of me believes that's another reason why we were taken. Maybe he pissed someone off when we were young. And next thing you know, right before nine 11 happens, you know, I'm, I'm this 14 year old kid. I'm going to log college middle school in uh Warminster. And here, here shows up this, this crazy, you know, CIA guy who I, I never knew in my life and he doesn't need to stay with us. Why is he staying with us? And then later nine 11 happened and he was there for more years. And I didn't know if that was just a coincidence or if indeed that was maybe a minder or, you know, someone who was maybe trying to groom me for something. Um, I don't know, but he definitely, definitely made an impression. And he taught me a lot of skills that, you would expect a CIA operative to teach a little kid. <laughs> really? Uh, he taught me, yeah, he taught me Aikido. Um, he taught me uh, how to paint. He taught me carpentry. Uh, we went hiking. He taught me how to trap animals. Uh, I, I would get up at 4 a.m. and I'd go running with him up Park Avenue uh, in Warminster. Uh, at the intersection there of Park Avenue and County Line Road was our church now it's like a landscaping company or something and uh we used to run up and down that every morning at 5 a.m when i was in eighth grade wow yeah, it was pretty hardcore and it was to prepare me for the track team and i ended up being really good at track because of him didn't stick with it but yeah he he made me just that much better wow and this this was the your your uncle cia guy right yeah. 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 So I, 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 anyway, I went into all that just to illustrate to everyone, you know, what kind of an impact this guy made on me. But yeah, I, 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 to this day, I get a feeling in my gut that maybe he was there partially because of my father's past activities. But he, he knew the pastor foster care parents. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, uncle John did. Yeah. And then my father, he actually knew my foster parents. Yeah. Yeah. Just through visitation. Um, but man, that's a wild, it, it, like, so it's a wild ride, right? I mean, it seems like yeah. th you're, you're, you have a life story that probably could be a book one day. Um, everybody says that everybody says my life's a movie. Yeah. Constantly. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds like it definitely could be. And, um, it, it's not even just, what you just shared, there's, there's layers to this and that's kind of where I want to kind of steer the conversation. Um, sure. So I want to kind of go into, I, I want to talk about the acid liquors. Uh, and okay. I, I was planning on, on not bringing that up till closer to the end, but I kind of just want to rip the bandaid off and, and kind of go into it a little bit. Yeah. I don't know how much you know about it, but I'd never heard of such things till I heard you talk about it. So uh, tell us about these acid liquors because I, I find it very interesting. Yeah. So one of the Afghans in the community up there in Reading uh, told me this story and I'll keep his name disclosed because he's not the kind of guy that would want me to do that. Just like my uncle wouldn't want me to say his last name. But just for the record, if you're in the CIA, I'm sure you know that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> but um. Anyway, uh, this guy that I met through my parents knew my father quite well from the time he was a very small child. And he grew up in Oak Brook. It's a community over there in Reading, um, in West Reading, I believe. 
And he told me the story that he read, I believe it was in the Hadith or the Quran. I never went and looked. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. I'm just reiterating what this guy told me. He said that there are these creatures in the earth and they're called Mabazume. And he said they're that these they're these acid liquors. Now I don't know if Mabazume is a Pashtu word because we're Pashtu. Uh, we, we don't we're not Kablan. You know we're not Kable. We're we're from Kabul. We're from Kandahar, and I believe one of the main dialects there is Pashtu. And uh, he said that these creatures called Mabazume, they live in the ground, live in the earth, and they have these tongues of acid. And apparently they're licking the side of the hill to try to break out to the surface. And at the end of each day, they get tired and they say, okay, we're going to stop. And if they don't say we're going to stop, inshallah, which is God willing or in God's name, the mountain grows back. And the next day it's back to square one. They have to lick all over again. The day they get to the very, very end and they just have like, you know, kind of like a Tootsie Pop, they have like one or two licks left. That's always when they get tired. The day they say, inshallah, They'll come back, two licks, they're in the surface. That's how I understand the story. And it's supposed to happen in the end of days as a form of judgment upon humanity. It's interesting because uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation that they might be coming very soon with these creatures coming back and roaming the earth, the surface level. Um, I think they're in office. Hey, man, you're, you and me are cut from the same cloth. Hey, li- listen, I mean, it is what it is. Um, I, I guess it's possible. I mean, what, what do these people have technology thousands of years ahead of us by now? Why isn't it possible? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, when we're talking about like the book of revelation, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, pointing towards the idea that in the end of days, there's going to be some serious, uh, scary days uh yeah the creatures that you couldn't even imagine roaming the earth and terrorizing yeah. humanity uh the cryptids all the cryptids yeah. i think they're gonna they're, they're gonna come and just do what they do i think i mean i think that that's probably why there's such a huge uptick in the uh in the cryptid sightings to be honest with you i mean it, it's really picked up a lot of steam and i think one is communication the internet is definitely aiding in that but um i also thought about plum island research center i also thought maybe that has something to do with it what island plum island research center that's supposedly like uh the real life version of the island of dr moreau where they're genetically splicing human dna with animals and they're coming up with these really really abnormal obscene creations so may- maybe there's some some of that going on. I don't know, but where does the technology come from? Could be the fallen ones. Yeah, and I believe, you know, they're the ones in office. I believe that's just what I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, when you say they're the ones in the off in office, what do, what do you mean by that? Like, be more specific. Um, I, I I think they're just a part of this these certain bloodlines that go back, and they're related to. Um, I don't know if you, I don't know if, you know, you'd call them reptilians or if you would call them draconians. I don't know if you would call them, uh, maybe they're related to some type of cryptid. I have no idea, but I don't believe that the people running this world are human in the sense that we're human. Perhaps they're being possessed by something extraterrestrial. Uh, that's what I've always thought because good hearted humans, you don't even have to be a Christian to not be a, an evil murdering. I mean, look around you. This isn't even my opinion at this point. This is just what you see when you look out your window, when you open your phone, when you turn on the news, when this is just what you see. And it's at this point, I don't think that word conspiracy theorist is being thrown around as much. Not nearly. I haven't heard it. It was very strong at the beginning of the pandemic, but now I don't hear anyone calling anyone a conspiracy theorist. I don't No. It's, yeah, it, yeah it's, that's kind of. That. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that over time, it's just become apparent that 
there are certain things that just people didn't either believe, understand to be even possible that turned out to be possible that people really don't, they don't know which way is up anymore. Um, I'm not going to say yep. any names on my end, but I, oh, I did, that's why they need this. What is that? A Bible. Oh, Bible. Yeah. I, that, that, that's why people need that. <laughs> I, I didn't recognize the, uh, the, 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 the logo on the front of it. Was that just a leaf or something? That's a uh, King James. King James. Gotcha. King James version. Um, I like the old school. Yeah, I, I I I page through a bunch of different versions depending on what I'm what I'm looking for and how I want to read it. You know, because sometimes I'm just like I right. just want to I just want to read it fluently, and it's like okay, so King James is off the shelf. It, it, that's not happening because King James is like okay, so ye means this, thou means that. Uh, yeah. yeah, but um. So I, I I had just posted on my Instagram stories a meme, and somebody who follows me that I know very well, uh, who typically doesn't agree with me on anything that I say because I'm a crazy conspiracy conservative monster mm. monster yep. hunter guy and and you know all that. So, um, <clears throat> but I posted it, it was just a picture of like Congress. And I said, I'm going to tell my kids this was Epstein's client list. And, oh. and I thought it was funny, so I posted it, you know? And uh, that person laughed at it. And I was like, five years ago, you would have been offended by that. And, yeah. you know, and, and now yeah. you're laughing at it because, like, to your point, it's like at some point, people are just coming to the realization that there's something very off here. Um, very off. And so I, I think I think people are slowly getting on the same page. Maybe not acknowledging it uh, consciously, but I think in their gut they are getting on the same page for sure. Uh, with the giant situation and your family, um, I I want to I want to bring up this idea of this guy that that your dad said was in the village that was a really big guy. Uh, if you could kind of share about that, what whatever he shared with you on that. Sure. So when my dad was uh, a young guy in his teens, there was a guy in his village who was a monster. He was a really big, heavily built man, and he was very tall as well. Uh, his name was Dos Mahmud. And Dos Mahmud one day was down by the river, um, I, I guess the same river where near where my dad saw this footprint near his village. And he saw him down there, you know, getting his water for the day, doing what he had to do. Some guy, I don't know if it was some guy in the village, my dad never said, or some guy like passing through, but he had a donkey with him and he was leading his donkey and his, this donkey had a big, big, big bag of flour on his back. So he's leading the donkey and fording the river. So he's walking through the water. The donkey's behind him. I guess he didn't secure the load that well. It slid off the donkey into the water. And this is a few hundred pounds we're talking about. Now you're introducing water. I mean, now it's going to be double, triple. I don't know how much more it's going to weigh. This guy starts freaking out because, I mean, I, he must have paid, you know, a pretty penny for all this flour. And who knows how long he has to travel. So he starts crying. And Dos Mahmud stands up, walks to where he is, saw the whole thing, gets down. And he Brian Shaw's this thing up and puts it on the donkey. And he's like, go ahead. Yeah. And my, my dad said that people in the village, they always joked that, you know, he's, he's like, you know, <laughs> he's part of this, like, uh, these gins. All right. So you say these gins, but I was just going to bring up the idea. I mean, are you, are you familiar with the Nephilim? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, like a lot of people talk about these giants in Afghanistan and in the Middle East and stuff being um, offspring of the Nephilim or, or Nephilim mm -hmm. offspring mm -hmm. of what fallen angels have done. Many this guy might have been. And that's what I was just going to say. Do you think that he could have? He might have been. You know, My dad said he was the biggest man he ever saw in his life. Wow. And your dad's a big guy. Like He was a strong guy himself. I mean, my dad was a strong guy, but he was a short guy. Um, this guy was very, very tall. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he 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 said he was taller than the door. Wow. Yeah. And door door frames what seven foot? Yeah, about something seven, like that. Yeah, seven feet. Yeah. So this this guy very well might have been like a Hodor from Game of Thrones. He might have had giant's blood Jeez. easily. 
Jeez. Yeah, he was a massive, just like Michelin tire man of a dude who's just a huge, thick, heavy, just a big, big guy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And he's able to pick up a four or five hundred pound soaking wet sack of flour off the riverbed, pick it up out of the water and put it on the donkey. You know, there's there's uh this this thought that, you know, Nephilim at least there's there's parts of the Nephilim, the DNA or bloodline that still exist today. And uh, you know, in people that probably don't even know. They they don't yep. even know that that's that's in them. Uh and there's a guy I don't know where we're at with this, but there's some guys that are working on getting another guy in studio here with me who supposedly is Nephilim bloodline. And apparently mm. he even had the six digits. Um, and is it the guy from Brazil? No, there's a guy from Brazil that has six legit fingers. No, this guy is stateside. He's here in this country. And, um, the, 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 it's a whole long story that, you know, we're working on right now, but, uh, supposedly even nature reacts to him differently. It's, you know, uh, it, it's just a very, very interesting person. I'd like to have sit mm. down at my table with me. Maybe I'll, I'll have to get an exercise chair, a bigger chair for him or something. I don't know, but, um, I'm hoping that I can get him in the studio here, but it's interesting that you bring that guy up because, uh, if he exists amongst the people in the village, it kind of goes to this idea that uh, my friend Joel, who uh, hosted the show for me a few weeks ago, he did a show and he called it Good Nephilim. And he kind of went into this idea that some Nephilim may not have been necessarily bad like their their fallen angel fathers would want them to be. And yeah. I, I, I find yeah. the idea very interesting. Uh, and so I, I, that guy being so close to, you know, giants and all that stuff. I mean, he really could have been possibly connected in some way lineage wise. Um, yep. So as far as the Jing go though, you brought them up. Let's go into that because uh, your uncle had an encounter with Jin. Your grandmother had multiple encounters with Jin because what she was doing. Yes. And then your yes. great uncle, uh, contacted the jinn and had something happen to him so yeah. I, I don't care what order you want to go in but let's t let's let's cover the jinn topic right now okay um well let me just start out by saying that most of my life i felt like there was something looming over me and i, I believe that it's for you know I, I believe it was a generational curse of some kind and people out there may think that's a little crazy but for the longest time i just kept dismissing it I, I kept saying that's a bunch of nonsense and it wasn't until i became a christian that i realized that that was actually what was going on because i had tried everything up until that point and bad things just kept on coming my way and i people told me a million times you're not a bad person why did this keep why does trouble seek you out why does everything possibly go wrong go wrong for you and I believe it's because my family for the longest time have been dabbling in these really, really nasty, filthy, disgusting, dark magic arts and dealing with these spirits. And I believe these spirits, they're coming to collect. And who's, you know, when, when the Social Security Act was passed, I believe it was in 1936, who's on the hook for that? everybody's grandkid everybody's great grandkid you know well that's kind of what was going on here was like a spiritual social security where it's like all right you 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 want all this you want all of this like upfront loans and stuff you want all these favors all you know you want me to hook you up okay fine your kids your grandkids your great grandkids they're gonna pay so my uncle experienced gins following him all the time in the mountains when he was growing up and he was small when he saw them because children, they're actually able to perceive these things a lot better than adults. And when he was a child, he would see this same thing, almost kind of like dancing, but he said the way it danced, it was like spinning as it was going up and down and it would follow him. And he said it would, he would get really dizzy and he would, in, he would get really dizzy and disoriented. 
oftentimes, and it would start giving him like a panic attack. Um, and he got really, you know, upset by it, scared by it. Uh, so he experienced that when he was young. Um, and mind you, I don't know if anyone on my mother's side of the family practiced this stuff that I never could substantiate because I didn't really speak the language when I reconnected with my mother when I was 18. And I I'm assuming maybe they did, but maybe my uncle did. I mean, when he was older and just didn't say anything, but this happened when he was a child. So who knows? Maybe his family was doing that as well. Um, you mentioned my, uh, the, my, 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 I believe it was my, it was my great uncle. He disappeared. Um, basically what he was doing was he was in his home and he was the village exorcist. Um, it was, it, yeah, yeah. It was, it was my grandmother's father. Yeah. It wasn't my great uncle. My great uncle was, he, he, he practiced that stuff, but he's not the one who disappeared. I believe it was my mother's father who was the uh, village exorcist who ended up disappearing. Um, he was doing a ritual in his home at night one time and they woke up in the morning and he was gone. Nobody saw him leave. The lights were still on. Everything was still there in place. He just vanished. And he had created something on the floor where he was, you know, doing his ritual inside of this, I guess it's like a circle of some kind. Um, and he just vanished without a trace. Uh, That's but, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that can be substantiated by my family as well. Um, well, the family when they were alive, <laughs> I guess not now, Yeah, but my, uh, my sisters actually uh, confirmed that for me as well. Wow. So, I yeah. mean, that, that, like, so, I mean, I know you're not too familiar with the show and everything, but uh, we talk about on the show a lot. I mean, people talk about these, this, this idea of other dimensions, other realms, portals to these other realms. And <clears throat> it's a very practical thing when you just think about the idea of, entities, whether it's jit, you want to call it jinn or demons, or you just want to take it down to the basic fundamentals of things um, and how they access our realms. They're not from here. They, 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 <clears throat> they, they come here though, and then they leave. And how do they do that? Right? So there, there's some kind of veil, thinning of the veil, a portal that they're, they're using the doorway to come in through to get here. Uh, and I, you're, you're talking to somebody who just absolutely believes that it can go the other way as well and that people whether they yeah. do it on purpose or not can access these other realms and it, i never actually thought that's what happened that's that's where my mind that may, maybe maybe he went like through an opening in maybe accidentally. I don't know, time space or something could be yeah like if he's doing a ritual and there's a circle and stuff and what i don't know what was happening but um my when you're describing it to me that that's exactly where my mind went that he did something and he just he he, he went and yeah and so just, yeah i thought maybe he was dead like you know they like took him like you know uh that patrick swayze movie ghost <laughs> the shadow things come and, uh so so i mean yeah. i've had several people on the show talk about in fact uh at the time of this recording the people will have already heard the recording that I'm, I'm going to refer to. Uh, but I've, I've had people on the show talk about how they've accidentally wound up what seemed to be, it was like here, but it wasn't here. It was something different. Um, mm -hmm. And th there's several instances of that. But most recently, I had a guy that I was talking to who is researching an area in the South and he witnessed a cube pop up on their thermal camera out in the middle of a meadow. And his team, I think it was two team members, went and investigated it and they literally, they couldn't see it with their naked eyes, but they were being directed and they literally walked into this cube and as they walked into the cube, they reported seeing the environment changing around them. Like it was like it was it was changing. It was different. It was still here, but it wasn't. And I think interesting. And I think that sometimes people accidentally find themselves 
uh, in situations, whether it's doing a ritual, <laughs> there's your sign, oh, or uh, just accidentally stumbling into areas that have a very thin veil at, the, at yeah. a very specific time. And they report having very bizarre things happen. Um, I even had a guy who, uh, out in Joshua Tree, California, he actually contacted me after I dropped an episode that had wild stuff on episode 512, I think it was, or 514. Um, but he contacted me and said that he had an experience in Joshua Tree where um, I guess his mom had passed away and he just wanted to get away. He went for a hike and he just was gone. He just, he disappeared. And there was news coverage of his disappearance for about four days. They were searching for him. They couldn't find him. And then he just reappeared in an area that they had already searched. And they asked him where he was. And he's like, I don't know. He said, I was here, but it didn't look like it was here. And then there's these beings walking up to me in these black cloaks, talking to me in a language I didn't understand. And what? Yeah. No. Oh no. So I, I've tried getting him on the show. You want to see something? You want to see something weird? Uh huh. Hang on. Please. Oh man. Oh, that's a little creepy. I'll show you why. So I sketch, I draw. And this is one of the dreams I had one night. Wow. Wow. That's a dream I had one night. That's great. Is that a bunch of bunch of them around like a circle too? Yeah, dude. Wow. You know what's really crazy is that the story that prompted the guy to send me his ex experience had people in cloaks around a, a, a I think it was a, a circle pentagram that was on fire on the ground. That's really well, really bizarre. That's pretty insane, dude. Yeah. I, I don't think that's a coincidence. How often do you uh draw your dreams down? Uh I guess whenever whenever I feel compelled, I'll show you a couple of them if you want. Do you give credence to There's one Here's one of them. Wow, that's very detailed. I don't even know what to make of that. Yeah, that's yeah, I'm a I'm a Tai Chi artist and that's a dream I had when I was doing Tai Chi and wow. these are the things and feelings I felt inside of my body. And I woke up and I drew them. And then here's another one. I was doing Tai Chi in my dream. <laughs> and I felt like I was like a tree, like a wood stump. And I'll, I'll show you one more. This one was really wild. I had a dream just about that. Interesting. Do you ever have any feelings as to what the dream's about? Nope. No clue. But that was that was easily the most freaky thing. <laughs> when you said these things and hooded cloaks coming up and talking to you. So No, it's it, yeah, I I mean um yeah, I mean, people have these experiences with the cloaked entities, the, these hooded cloaked entities, uh, no faces, you know, and uh, very reminiscent of the Grim Reaper, uh, things like that. It, it's, 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 yeah, a really uh, freaky. And yeah. that was from a long time ago. That was from before I was a Christian, um, is I was having those dreams. I haven't had those dreams since. Interesting. Believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so I I, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit here because I just want to just to tell you, but also the audience that uh, we so on our website we actually took down the blog. It's still I I still have access to it, but it's just not on the website. And we will get it back up eventually, uh, but we're we're doing some maintenance on things. But uh, years ago, uh, I want to say it was probably about five years ago, six years ago, 
my wife wrote a blog about the legends of giants uh, throughout scripture, but also uh, into modern day. And right. we had a guy who contacted us who was in the military talking about how he would talk to people that were locals while he was stationed in Afghanistan. And he was told that there is a very small section of land uh, that actually borders China in Afghanistan. And that area is a, a nature preserve. And in that nature preserve, there are giants. And he was warned not to go up there. And so like th- this, the idea of giants is something that really seems to cover a very vast landscape. Obviously, it's probably not just Afghanistan, uh, but when you look at where Kandahar is on the map versus where that China border is, it's a very long distance. And so if you're getting these legends of giants that, that far apart, there's probably a good chance that surrounding countries also have these, these stories of giants. Why Afghanistan uh, has been focused on so heavily I'm not exactly sure why, but it, it's very apparent to me that in the Middle East, there are legends of giants of old, but also happening still today. And I, I find it very, very interesting. Now, um, your, your, I think you said it was your mom's father that had disappeared? My, my, my grandmother's father. Your grandmother's father uh, had disappeared. And is this the same grandmother that was... A witch? A witch. Okay, yep. so probably pretty good chance that uh, dad was in the same business. Is that is that safe to say? Yeah, which is kind of unusual because the, the men aren't usually involved in that kind of thing as much as the women. Interesting. I wonder if there's an amplification there for the, uh, the, the family tree then. You know, maybe there's a reason why, you know, you, you've had your experiences and stuff because it's so deeply rooted in your family yeah. tree. Like you mentioned about they, they come there that they come to collect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. An- another, um, I guess a more scientific term for the generational curse is, uh, inherited trauma. Um, so people can make of that, of what, you know, what they will. <laughs> so I've never heard that term before inherited trauma. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I only recently heard about it as well. Um, my mm-hmm. buddy saw my interview with, uh, Terry and he said, you know, that that's, that's pretty wild. It sounds like you have a lot of inherited trauma. I said, well, what is that? He said, well, I guess some people would call it generational curses. It's very interesting. Well, let, let's- which is weird. I mean, I don't cause these things to happen to me that happen to me half the time. So <laughs> I don't know. But- yeah. Well, let's move into your grandmother then, because we didn't really touch on sure. exactly what what all she she has been, I guess, involved in or whatever. But I know mm. you've mentioned about certain stories and stuff that you were told that your grandmother was seen doing and things. Obviously, we mentioned about her um, and feeding the uh, animals to the giant. Uh, there's definitely uh, room to speculate, at least, as to what was be happening there. You know, it. it could it could it have been just simply here's a goat please leave us alone maybe uh but th- does that mean that everybody in the village is doing that same thing why is it just her uh there's a lot of you know questions that we could have that probably would never be answered but uh what are some of the things that that you've been told that you your grandmother would do uh my father said that sometimes he would see the broom kind of have a life of its own and it would be sweeping you know, very like cliche, you know, witch in her broom, um, except she was actually using it for its intended purpose. (laughs) She wasn't trying to float on it. Um, yeah, that, that, that's one of the only other things I've heard, uh, that she would do is she would get, um, she kind of get the, her little like bibbity bobbity boo on with (laughs) the chores, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's very Disney esque, right? Uh, yeah. So it seems like the jinn now from what I understand jinn are basically demons right that are within the middle eastern they're like culture. smokeless fire beings yeah really i've never heard it described yeah, like that yeah yeah they're they're basically um, cuz uh in islam humans are made from dust angels are made from light 
and gins are made from fire only it's supposed to be like a smokeless fire yeah so that might be why they appear like kind of like they're shrouded in, in in something um perhaps wow oh, yeah, i've never i've never heard that before that's interesting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very interesting yeah. uh so these things are common encounters within your family tree line or if your family tree lineage, uh, have you ever suspected having an encounter with a djinn? Um, not with a djinn, but I've experienced paranormal things. Um, yeah, go into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, I paint homes. Um, I have my own contracting business and I pretty much have experienced, uh, I, I guess you could say hauntings in some of these homes I've painted. Um, there was one time where I was working for a company. Uh, this is when I wasn't operating my own thing, but I was working for a company and I was painting by myself and I thought I saw these shadow figures out of the corner of my eye running across, uh, in, in the corner bedroom there. And I was in the hallway, I was painting the ceiling in the stairwell there. And I thought out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run past like a, a shadow. So I looked and I felt, I felt really kind of uneasy when it happened. Uh, so I, I, I kind of ignored it and then it happened like three more times. Uh, so <laughs> that was one occurrence that I experienced. Um, another one was when I was here in my home, the one time, uh, my girlfriend's mother had just died and she had to go down to North Carolina, uh, to be with her family. And this would have been in January of 20, 2022. And I was home by myself. I had just gotten off work and I came home. Uh, this is before I had a dog. So I'm all alone. And my girl, she had taken an avo- avocado seed and she'd uh, grown a really big, respectable plant out of it. So we had this avocado plant over here in the corner, right next to our sliding door. And out of nowhere, the leaf is like this. And I, this wasn't even out of the corner of my eye. I legit saw it do this. I saw that and I'm like, oh no, what, <laughs> what's going on here? What is that? And uh, I saw things move. Um, the one time we were sitting on the couch and we were watching TV and all of a sudden, you know, our shoe rack next to our front door just kind of like slid and just fell. And we thought maybe, oh, we have a mouse in here or something, but no, there was no mouse. Um, that was another time. Another time was when I was living at a home um, in uh, in Mount Penn there. And when I first moved into that home, I went into the basement and I found this little bracelet, you know, kind of hanging from the ceiling, from the uh, ceiling beams, from the uh, the beams above you in the basement. And I wish I didn't touch it. Okay. I, I believe that maybe I disturbed something. Uh, I saw the initials on the bracelet. And, you know, it it was a, it was a cute little bracelet and I figured, Hey, I'll give this to a girl if I meet her. (laughs) And this was in like 2012 when we uh, moved into that home. It was, uh, I believe August of 2012. Um, I was there by myself painting and my dad was still at the old house, packing stuff up, going to work, doing what he did. So I went outside and we had a shed out back of that property. And I saw the initials in the concrete where, you know, this family had built this shed. And it was the same initials as the, as the bracelet I had. Ever since I took that bracelet back in the house and put it up in the room I was staying in, weird stuff would happen all the time. And I didn't realize it until much later that perhaps I disturbed something and I, sh- I should have, I, I should have left that bracelet alone. Um, so what I ended up doing in, in, I guess I was trying to appease this thing. I went down to the basement and I put the bracelet right back, right back where it was. And I never experienced anything ever again. Huh. And then, uh, some months later is when my father died. And after my dad died, the activity really, really picked up in the house. Um, I, I stayed upstairs and my home was built in 1921, the home that my father and I got and that he died in. Um, it was built in 1921 and 
the upstairs was pretty much mine. My mother would stay downstairs. Steps didn't agree with her. And I stayed upstairs and I had the whole second floor and the third floor to myself. And my bedroom led up to the third floor. Without fail, every same time of the week, that door would pop open on its own while I was sleeping at the same time. At, always, without fail. And it got to a point where I just put a lock on it so that that wouldn't happen. And it didn't happen after that. Um, there was another time that, and I believe there was like some type of spirit that was living up in that attic. And it was a finished attic. It was like a bedroom. And it was really weird because it had these two built pull out like beds. One was pink and one was blue and they was on wheels and they kind of slid like gigantic drawers into the, uh, into the walls, but they were like beds for, I guess, uh, they were twins. A boy and a girl would be my guess, or maybe two girls or two boys. One, you know, liked pink one didn't, you know, and, uh, there was some weird activity that went on up there. One time I was babysitting uh, a cat for my friend. Uh, he went out to Colorado and he asked me to watch his cat for a week. So I kept the cat up there. About three or four times that cat came tumbling down the steps and was convulsing in seizures. And it really upset me because that cat had never done that before or after that. So I knew that there was something really funky living in my home. And I thought at that point, maybe it was my dad. Uh, because... Or maybe it was this thing that the bracelet belonged to. I don't know. Um, but I, I experienced some really, really weird things. In fact, my friends, when they came over, you came through the back door. And the first thing you saw was the stairwell to the basement. And then to the right was the kitchen. And they would like run past the, the basement entrance. <laughs> Every one of them experienced that. Would they, would they like acknowledge their fear of the basement or was it something that you just noticed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was an unfinished basement, you know, it like one of these unfinished, uh, just stone and a bare cement floor and kind of looked like something out of saw. Cause it had like cobwebs and all that stuff down there. It, yeah. it was not finished. Um, but yeah, they, they expressed it. They said that is a freaky basement. Even the entrance going down is freaky. Yeah. So. These things that you just shared, are these the things that you were talking about when you mentioned to me about the, the paranormal things that you came to know through martial arts? That's other stuff. Um, what yeah, is, that's something different entirely. What, I, 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 uh, okay. Okay. Um, some years ago, I knew someone who practiced a martial art out of, I want to say it was, uh, I want to say it was uh, a, a really obscure you know, martial art that they practice in Vietnam and Laos. And he said, what they do is they have these tattoos put on them, uh, on their backs and on their chests, you know, wherever. And apparently now you have this spirit attached to you and it's going to help you in a fight. <laughs> that's, that's what some of these folks believe. Um, another one was, I trained under a guy, uh, training iron body. Uh, I won't say his name. I don't think he would want this information getting out, but he was up in, uh, new England where he's from. And he was in the Chinatown up there in one of those cities. I won't say the city so that, you know, people can't narrow it down. Um, and he went, you know, he was very, he, he still to this day is one of the, scariest teachers i've ever met guy can smash a coconut with his bare hands no problem Jeez. you know you take a coconut off the off the grocery shelf and give it to him <laughs> explode i might have given him away but anyway <laughs> um he's known for that feat and he said he went into this back room of a restaurant that his friends knew this these you know the, the chinese mainland chinese uh people and there was some guy there that he never saw before some little old guy and there were some flowers in a vase sitting on top of the table and he said this guy started doing you know started doing some qigong exercises and all of a sudden the plants just withered and died he got out of there he said he left 
he just he just got out of there. He left. He was really, really, really disturbed by that. Yeah, and he sure. he found out. Yeah, he found out later that's a form of Chinese black magic uh, from the Taoist sect of Kung Fu, and uh, some of these um, some some of these Taoist practitioners they know how to consort with these uh, spiritual powers. These jins, these jins, allow them to do that kind of stuff. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the old, like the dudes that live in the mountains that, you know, like the hermits, the ones you never hear about, the ones you're never going to hear about. I mean, he didn't even know who this dude was. Um, so that's incredible. So that's, that's, that's some of the crazy, weird paranormal stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, so when it comes to the, the old man, I mean, was, was he, I mean, you probably don't even know, but was he doing a demonstration for somebody or was he just doing it for kicks and giggles? Uh, I believe this guy was doing um, a demonstration of his practice for a lot of the you know Chinese community. And he was just one of a bunch of people that was present when it, when it went down. Um, but he was very disturbed by that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was just a showcase. Because apparently they can suck the they can suck the life force out of this and put it into other people if they want Jeez, as well. That's crazy. <laughs> or just keep it for themselves, but there's a price to pay. He told me there's, you know, he told me the name of what this art is. Uh he speaks Chinese, so he knows, but I don't remember what it is. But if someone out there is watching and they're familiar with this, it, it's it's real stuff. Yeah, I'm sure somebody listening or watching on YouTube uh, is probably familiar. Uh, or going, this guy's full of it. <laughs> no, 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 no. My my audience, yeah. my audience, yeah. uh, they they're used to hearing the crazy wild stories off this show for sure. Um, mm, yeah. So I asked that. I, I really wanted you to go into it because I wanted to make sure you weren't going to say, "Yeah, Taekwondo," because that's what my son's doing right now. And I was like, if he says Taekwondo, I'm going, son. You're doing jujitsu, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, my, my son is he's he's loving martial arts. He's been um, he's been yeah. here for about I think uh yeah about a year now, and uh, he's nice. he's just been he's been doing really well with it. Um, he's young too; he just turned six. So uh, as long as he enjoys it, I'm good with it. You know, yeah, it's one of those things where I yeah. I don't I don't want to force him to do anything he doesn't want to do. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like. I paid for it. So you're going to do, you're going to finish out the, the, my, yeah. the schedule, but, uh, I don't, yeah. I don't want to make him stay in it, but, uh, he seems to really be enjoying it. So I'm, I'm enjoying just watching him do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's always, always a good time to watch kids develop, uh, martial arts. Arts. I've learned that I, I I'm seeing that he's learning how to, um, develop disciplines at such a young age that he didn't mm -hmm. come in with, which is nice because yep. You know, uh, my son, I mean, he's six years old, born in uh, December 2017. You know, he had just turned two when the whole, and I'm from the area you were in, so we can talk, speak the same language. Like, yeah, when COVID yeah. hit, everything shut down and, you know, churches were closing up and it was just like, there wasn't really socialization for the kid at two years old. And so when we came down here to Tennessee, um, he had some ground to make up in that department. And, uh, mm. so, you know, things that he probably shouldn't be crying about would really make him upset and cry. He didn't understand losing. He didn't understand competition. And yep. when he first started going, he, he, everything would make him cry. And, um, and I would talk to his instructors and just let him know that, you know, he's, you know, he's sensitive and things like that. But in the past year of him doing it, he's really grown in that department and, um, he can handle a lot now. Uh, this, yeah. this past week, he just got bumped up to the black belt club. Um, and nice. yeah, he, and, and for the first time he's, it's a different type of competition between him and the, the kids around him and stuff. And it was just, they were doing some, some kicking drills and the, the goal was to make sure the bag didn't come back and kick, it hit you in the face and he didn't get that idea and it smacked him yeah. in the face. He's <laughs> like, why is this kid trying to hit me? <laughs> and so it upset him, but, yeah. um, overall I timing think, yeah exactly overall yeah, i think yeah, the yeah. martial arts has been such a, a great thing for the kid and he really seems to enjoy it so uh anyways that's yeah, just great stuff just a little sidetrack into my personal life that was unnecessary um so no no it's good man <laughs> 
But uh, I, I kind of want to wrap up here with uh, this last thing because I want to make sure we bring it up. And this is the your older sister and what uh, I guess somebody had seen her doing in her sleep. Yeah. Yeah. One of her friends um, said that she was sleeping on the floor and my sister's up on the bed and she just saw my sister start to levitate and there was like these black things surrounding her. Yeah. Uh, really wild stuff. And this is a, this is a, this is a woman that is not known for fabricating stories. Like she'd hear this stuff and be like, I'm done. <laughs> I want no, I want no part of you people. So for her to say that she saw this is very unusual. Is, is this sister a blood sister? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's, she's my oldest blood sister. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think that has something to do with then your, the the family uh, generational curse type of thing? Oh yeah. So it's not like yeah. she was doing oh, anything specifically. Yeah. No, she doesn't practice anything. Okay. In fact, she's quite skeptical of a lot of things. Really? Yeah. But she has a she has more uh, she has more of these weird odd uh, dreams than anyone I've ever met. Does anything ever come to her in her dreams consistently? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you, but she dreamt that my mother was going to die. Um, she, she just has a lot of these really weird dreams. It, it, well, what did your mom actually die then or what? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. My mother was in a nursing home and she wasn't doing well, but, um, you know, my oldest sister said, Hey, I had a, and th this is the one I was living with in Jersey right after I moved from Berks County. Um, and right before I moved back here to the uh, uh, Philadelphia area, um, yeah, yeah, she uh, she was living in a nursing home, and she had a dream that my mother passed. And sure enough, later that day, it happened. Wow, wow, yeah, I know yeah. that. I think that in our more Western culture, we we tend to really just not even think about the impact that dreams have in our lives and what they are. Yeah. Um, but you know, you've brought out the Bible several times and stuff being, it's saying that you're a Christian. I mean, like we see in the old Testament, like dreams were very, very, um, important and mm -hmm. it, it, enough that they had to be interpreted so that people understood what was coming. And, uh, yeah. and so I, I think, I think the, the more we put weight into, to the, the dream realm, I think, honestly, I think the more clear things might become for us, uh, and I, you're talking to somebody who doesn't remember his dreams. Like I couldn't draw my dreams down because I don't remember my dreams. Uh, and I, and people have told me that I should tell myself before I go to sleep every night, remember your dreams, remember your dreams, remember your dreams, and that I'll start remembering my dreams then. But it hasn't happened yet. So, if you wanna, if you wanna remember your dreams. Here's what I did. Um, I did this years ago, years and years ago, over a decade ago. I had a notebook and a pen next to my bed, and I'd go to sleep. And the second I woke up, I wrote down my dream. If you do that after about three or four days, you will remember it every time. But you have to keep on doing it. Hmm. Um, another way I've seen someone do is they have a, a cup of water. They drink half the cup of water and then put the other cup next to them. And they tell themselves before they go to bed, and they say it in the cup of water. When I drink this other half of the cup, when I wake up, I will remember my dreams. Really? And you, yeah, you drink half the cup of water. You say that to the cup, put it over there, go to sleep, wake up, drink the other half of the cup of water, and you're supposed to remember them. I never tried that, but somebody uh, says that. That's, you know, that's almost like I did the thing where you wrote them down. That's almost like a form of hypnosis on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, you're convincing your, your subconscious to not stay dormant. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I, I literally forgot about this till just now. So I, I'm, you've probably seen me on video. The audience won't see because my brother will edit it all together, but I, I've been coughing a lot during this interview. Um, I, I, I just less than 24 hours ago, I had 103 feet. I haven't heard you cough once. <laughs> well, I was coughing, but I was muting my mic. Um, oh, okay. And, okay. But I, I got a whole bag of nice. cough drops here. Uh, mm. and, I, less less than twenty four hours ago, I had over a hundred and three fever, and um, Ooh. Man, I a trooper. I, I was literally laying in bed, 
I, I took a ton of NyQuil and I'm just laying there sleeping. It was probably about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I'm just in bed trying to sleep for the rest of the day kind of thing, uh, which yeah. didn't happen. I, I, I popped some NyQuil probably around three. I woke up around six ish, I'd say. Well, in that period of time of me sleeping, I, I, I woke, I woke up and I, I went out to the kitchen and I sat down and I said to my wife, I think I just had an out of body experience and I've mm. never had an out of body experience. And I still don't know if I ever had one. Um, but do you want one? No, 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 I don't know. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a way to do that very easily and very, very well. I, I'll let somebody else do it. I, I, okay. I, I don't, I don't want to mess with it. Um, but, and the only reason why I say this, that I think I might've had it is because when I came out of the bedroom to go into the kitchen, I walk into the kitchen and my wife is doing the exact thing that I thought I dreamt her doing, which was she was making these these chicken tacos and wrapping the 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 meat and the insides with lettuce instead of the taco shell. And she was doing the exact thing that I thought I dreamt. And I was <clears throat> like, did I just, you know, like I'm so sick. Did something happen where I just kind of went whoop, and I, I kind of nope. peered through the wall nope. or something? I don't know. It was very nope. strange to me. Did you feel like did you feel like you were floating down your hallway when you saw this? Uh, I felt like looking back, I feel like I was standing. If if I didn't know any better, it, it feels like a Steven Spielberg movie, right? Like you just see like a. It's almost like you're looking through like a camera lens. When yeah. It happens. Yeah, like yeah, like almost yeah. like yeah. You had an out of body experience. I don't, I don't want it. I don't want to believe it. But it's it's yeah. it it definitely felt like it because I felt like I was it, like like I was standing there as a ghost almost watching her do this, and then yeah. I wake up and I walk out there and she's doing the exact thing that I thought I was just dreaming about, and uh, and I yeah. I ate them because they were delicious. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had, I had an out of body experience. It's like, yo, bro, go wake up. This is good stuff. You want to get it fresh? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> but um, that's great. But yeah, I mean, I, I've never had an experience like that before. I mean, I've talked to countless of people who have had experiences like that. Um, I've never had that happen before. It's 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 actually very easy to do. Um, I was. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, there's this uh, there's this thing called the gateway experience. Have you heard of it? Uh, I don't know about it, but I've heard of it. Okay. It's called the gateway experience and it's by uh, something called the Monroe Institute and they have different levels of it and they're, they're all connected. They all like feed off of the last one, but it's basically how to astral travel, how to lucid dream and how to have out of body experiences. And I was dabbling with that for a long time and it's a very surefire way to get good at it. <laughs> not not endorsing it for people out there because um i was doing it for a while and then i became a christian and then i tried to do it again and i had all kinds of crazy anxiety when i did it mm. wow. unexplainable anxiety i had voices telling me you need to stop this you need to stop this you're going to come back with something that you didn't want to come back with you're going to meet something out there and we can't protect you once you leave this plane because that's what you're doing um that stuff is wild i warn anyone who's watching this if you go to youtube and you have headphones and there's the gateway experience you can find it by the monroe institute it is one of the wildest things you could ever put your brain through i yeah. um, and there are a system of meditations that really really do induce genuine out-of-body experiences and out of uh astral travel and all of that yeah the the gateway experience uh that um experiment right not experience experiment right gateway experiment the the gateway experience experience okay well either way uh, I, I i it's been mentioned on the show a few times and i think the last time it was mentioned was i had a guy here in studio with his team his name's uh stacy brown and they were the last paranormal research team to investigate the uh conjuring house 
and okay. it, before it changed ownership. And so the, the, the owner that he knew said, you guys can come in here. All rules are off. You can do anything you want. And they did things that were far beyond anything that I ever would want to try. Um, <laughs> Probably. And, yeah. And they, that was one of the things they did though. They, they, they did that um, gateway experience. Uh, and I don't remember exactly all their experiences with it, but uh, yeah, I, I, that kind of stuff, I don't, I, that just. No. It's transcendental meditation is pretty much what it is. And you're basically traveling to different astral planes in the ether. It's real. Oh, it's I swear real. to you, it's real. Oh, it's real. Yeah. Cause when you're, when you're under, you're, you, you really have like more of a sense of your body and everything. Like you can feel every little twitch. You can feel your, you can feel your blood running up and down your body when you're when you're in that state it's really wild you can feel you're like i i actually felt like my intestines emptying into my colon when i was under the one time really it was wild yeah it was wild yeah man that must be feeling that must feel weird <laughs> it was it was it was not like pleasant knowing that's what it was <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh yeah <laughs> really weird no, it, it sounds really weird. No, I, I, um, I'll, I'll let somebody else do it. You know, there's plenty of people who, who practice it and people who listen to the show that do it. I'll let you guys do all that stuff yourselves. I'll not, just, not for me anymore. <laughs> I'll sit back yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you talk about mm-hmm. it. I'll let you tell me the stories and stuff, but, uh, a homeboy ain't playing that. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, right. yeah, but, um, yeah. But Ray, man, listen, I, I appreciate you coming on and just chat with me about this stuff. Uh, I wasn't yeah, sure. For me. I wasn't sure exactly what your experiences were outside of Giants until you sent me that note the other day. Uh, I think it was probably actually last week at this point, but when you text me that list of things, and I, I found it very interesting. And, and I think there is something to the idea of the generational curse uh, idea that you presented. Uh, wh- when it comes to the Giants, though, uh, do you think? And uh, just this is your own opinion. Uh, do you think that this is still a current thing happening throughout the world? People are encountering giants that probably come from biblical times. I, I believe so. Yeah. Um, I believe somewhere in the Bible it says that they're from the bloodline of Seth or something like that. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's, it's one of the theories. Yeah, yeah. So this guy that you want to sit down with, maybe, I mean, maybe he's got, you know, that bloodline in him. Yeah, you, you never know. I mean, they talk about Merovingian bloodline and stuff too, right? And how that's supposed to exist today. Um, I believe a lot of these. Uh, would you, question for you? Would you consider these giants as cryptids? Um, yeah, I guess. Or like. I, like tribal beings, not cryptids. I wouldn't. Like say, like, I, I, wouldn't I, I mean, when you say tribal beings, I, that that puts it more in along lines of human to me, and I don't think that these giants are. So they're not like people, civilized people per se. They're no. like these jinns. They I mean, really are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it's a very interesting question because I think that there's different types, uh, and it, it depends on what percentage you have of it, maybe. Uh, because I do think yeah. that that there are so. I think that the Nephilim, say the biblical Nephilim, the 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 old, you know, for the the first gen, uh, those yeah, those Nephilim, gen. they uh, they had abilities that were supernatural. Uh, their fathers were supernatural beings. The, 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 right, these are fallen right. angels. Fallen angels, according to the Book of Enoch alone, talk about how they taught humans how to do things that were supernatural. If you don't think that their their, their offspring could do what they did, you're sorely mistaken. So, um, the, the, these these beings had abilities that were were superhuman. They were they were not just in, in strength, but abilities and 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 supernatural things. Uh, as time goes on. I think that has dwindled away. I don't think it's completely gone, but I don't think that let's, let's say there's say say you have 20 Nephilim in a room, modern day Nephilim in a room. I don't think they all can do what each other can do, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean I mean I I certainly believe it's possible that 
these creatures are still running around and people are seeing them, right? So maybe maybe there's an uptick in uh, their assembly line or something. You know, maybe they're or maybe these uh, gateways to the other side are opening up more and more because I mean the Bible says that's supposed to happen. So well, maybe they're just starting to come out of the ground. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I even have an episode called "The Return of the Nephilim," and I think that that's essentially what you're describing. And even Ellie Marzulli, who was on the show not too long ago, talked about how we were talking about cattle mutilations, and he believes that they are actually using the blood from the cattle mutilations to incubate uh, in in um, created wombs hybrid beings for mm. a future battle. And uh, he believes that be. he believes that these uh, people who are being abducted uh, and impregnated, and then those babies are mysteriously taken from their womb, are just that. And so, um, see, I just had a cough there. Um, but uh, it, it's it's an interesting concept, and he does a better job explaining it than I do. But I, I definitely agree with it. And my friend Joel, uh, my friend Joel Thomas, who hosted the show not too long ago, I mentioned earlier, the good Nephilim guy. Um, his, his, he thinks the same exact thing. He calls them meat sacks, uh, that, that, that they're, they're basically brewing these hybrid beings and these, these Nephilim meat sacks for a future battle. And so it's very interesting concepts for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say <laughs> pretty interesting for sure. Yeah. So, uh, I appreciate you joining me though today, man. And, uh, this was Thanks for having a really me. fun conversation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to your next show. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. I certainly enjoyed it. So if you enjoyed it like I did, please share it with people you think will enjoy it too. All right, friends, until next Tuesday, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. Just know me, all over my thoughts consume me. I'm laying with death like I'm spooning. Everything I'm chasing, eluding. I'm this prison awaits. I can't find escape. Cause I wanna taste the change. Wanna know what the definition of a sorry is Everything I'm chasing out of reach like shatari ships I feel when people say they feel me, they just say they do Tentacles of praise turning into calamari So A little stretch every song I bleed Just a little recognition is all I need And God, I'm feeling growth, but every time I look inside I'm looking at the branches of a bonsai tree uh, And I don't know what I'ma leave when I leave here Cause the mics just become a pair of sheep shears And I'm fighting for change, but legacy's important too Scrambling for more days, more leap years Feeling like a mega block around some Lego In a chamber of my own thoughts, my own echoes Lows never seem to hit the false set, though Is it wrong for me to judge myself on what I've done? Know where I'm going, yeah Is it wrong for me to see what I'm going to be And where I'm going Showers will pour in your feelings Oh, rain is our 
part of the healing, ayy Leave you with nothing concealing, ayy Most of us run from affliction To some of us it's an addiction The way that the rays from the sun Keep coming up missing